All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm just going to put my headphones in, make sure we're going live here. If you guys have any comments, let me know. My name is Steve Siegel. I'm a fellow of minimal invasive surgery at Penn State. And this is session one of our flexible endoscopy group. We're going to be doing four sessions. Session number one is flexible endoscopy basics. We're going to start with diagnostic upper and lower endoscopy, talking about feeding access. Uh, we're going to push the endoscopic energy um, talk to the future for the sake of time. And then we're going to be talking about GI bleeding. <clears throat> so uh, the, some of the future directions, um, our second round is going to be talking about dilation, stenting, and management of GI defects. Round three, we'll be talking about flexible endoscopy in um, bariatric patients. And then round four, we'll start to be uh, talking about some, mu some mucosal techniques, so POEM, POP, and Z POEM. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get started by introducing Jessica Ardila. She's a um, minimally invasive fellow uh, at Stony Brook, and she'll be giving a talk about uh, diagnostic upper and lower endoscopy. All right, thank you. Um, let me get my slides on. So, um, so yeah, my name is Jessica Ardilla. I am an MIS bariatric fellow at Stony Brook Medicine. I'm just going to be talking about um, diagnostic upper and lower endoscopy. So the objectives are going to be pre-procedure planning uh, and then indication, room positioning, technique, and common findings for both upper and lower endoscopies. So when we talk about pre-procedure planning, we have to start obviously with uh, making sure we have a thorough HP, HMP of, a, of our patient, uh, that we have a complete past medical history, especially uh, any long heart or kidney disease that might um, interact or might affect the choice of drugs that we're gonna give the patient for sedation. Also important to notice the past surgical history. Um, we wanna know if they have especially any GI history, GI surgery history, because that might help us anticipate what we're gonna find during the endoscopy. Also, if we're doing a colonoscopy, the patient have had a, hysterect a hysterectomy, then we might anticipate that going through the sigmoid might be a little bit harder. Um, also, we wanna notice any pre-procedures, uh, like scopes in the past, if they have had one, we wanna review those records, uh, wanna make sure what sedation they got or if they had any problems during the procedure. Uh, of course, the patient needs to be consented. They have to be NPO at least six hours from uh, sub meals, uh, two hours from um, clear liquids. Uh, for a colonoscopy, they need to have a bowel prep that we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, we need to notice what medications they're on, uh, especially any anticoagulation that some of them might have to be stopped before, especially if we're planning on doing any sort of biopsy. Um, review any labs depending on, the, on their history, and uh, then make sure we have all the medications we're going to need for the conscious sedation that we're going to provide. We're going to use um, narcotics usually, uh, fentanyl or Versed, and uh, also for sedation, benzodiazepines like um, Versed. I, I said around narcotics, you, you, know, you, you use fentanyl or uh, Demerol. But um, then we move along and we also wanna make sure you have all the equipment that includes obviously all your endoscopy equipment, um, that you have your scope, that the buttons are in, that your um, suction and um, irrigation is working, um, and then the insufflator that you have, that the button is on, on the um, biopsy channel, that the light is working properly and it's connected to the video and it's all uh, working fine. You also want to make sure that your wheels are working properly. The big wheel uh, helps you uh, or there, its function is to put the tip up and down and the little wheel it's to turn uh, right and left. We want to make sure that the locking system works as well. Some people will start the scope with a, especially the little wheel locked. It, it depends. You can do it either way. Uh, you also want to make sure that in the, in the, in the endoscopy suite, you have um, 
all the equipment you need, like a reversal medication, a defibrillator, and uh, an intubation kit in, in case you run into any problems. Uh, it's important to notice that you can use it for insufflation, you can use CO2 or air and several studies have been used, have been done to figure this out. CO2 is totally appropriate. It actually has been shown that it improves the tolerance of the patients, it decreases the pain and the residual gas after uh, the procedure. So we recommend that we can use that. Um, so going ahead and talking about opera endoscopy, we use this to diagnose any problems in the oropharynx, esophagus, stomach, or proximal duodenum. Um, in the indications, it can be for diagnosis, screening or surveillance or therapeutic sure. options. Are you, um, okay. So for a diagnostic, um, some of the, the reasons we use it is for um, you, patients babe. who've had persistent upper abdominal, um, for, for example, like weight loss, uh, or, or symptoms that have been there, had been treated, but they have not resolved. Any new symptoms, especially patients over the age of 50 that develop nausea, vomiting, um, dysphagia, adenophagia, um, also refractory re, uh, reflux, patients have been in treatment, but they still have a lot of symptoms. Um, we're going to do a diagnostic EGD also for confirmation of suspected lesion, like an ulcer or gastritis, or if you suspect that the patient might have a, a neoplasia or Barrett's. For GI bleeding, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, um, any acute caustic ingestion, because we want to assess the extent of the injury. Uh, if you need to do a biopsy of a known lesion, um, or any abnormal imaging. If a patient had had an incidental finding on a CT scan and you want to further assess that, a diagnostic EGD is indicated. And for intraoperative evaluation for any foregut surgery. For screening and surveillance, we use endoscopy mostly to rule out malignancy in high-risk patients, like patients who have uh, significant reflux, to uh, rule out cancer, although that's not necessarily gastric cancer um, screening, it's really on selected patients, it's not done in any, everybody. Uh, for dysplasia surveillance in patients who have bar Barrett's, um, follow up after medical, surgical, or any endoscopic treatment, like after a gastrectomy, after Barrett's have been treated uh, with endoscopic maneuvers or, or just medical treatment, you wanna still surveil these patients. Um, evaluate bariatric uh, patients, uh, especially, usually, I guess, if surveillance, if they have any problems postoperatively. Patients with portal hypertension that you want to screen for esophageal varices. Uh, patients who had a history of costing ingestion, you want to uh, surveil them because they are prone to develop squamous cell carcinoma. And also, Patients who you want to make sure that you identify anything on the upper GI uh, or any pathology that might interfere with uh, further treatment that you're planning to do. So for example, if you have a patient who had a history of an upper GI bleed and you need to um, start them on anticoagulation, you want to make sure that you rule out any persistent GI bleed source. And therapeutic indications for removal of a foreign body or polyps. Jessica? Yeah. I think your slides are coming off, coming across a little um, chopped up. Do they look normal on your side? They look fine. Yeah, let me. Uh, can you maybe uh, maybe exit out and uh, yeah, and maybe exit out the presentation mode and restart uh, that slide? Yeah, give me a second. They're coming back a little choppy for some reason. Yeah, I'll just go back to it. Thanks. Can you guys see it now? Looks good. We'll let you know if it chops up again. Okay. Um, some therapeutic um, indications as we talked about, also for banding uh, of varices, placement of feeding tubes that we're gonna be talking about later today um, in a different session. And for intraluminal surgery, like treatment of achalasia or gastroparesis or poem and pop, um, and also for Barrett's. 
and palliation for dilation uh, of, of, of stenosis from a tumor or bleeding. So when we take the patient to the endoscopy suite, as we talked about, they're gonna be on tele and they're gonna be on a pulse ox and you wanna place them on a left lateral position. Uh, obviously the anesthetist, the anesthetist nurse or the anesthesiologist are gonna be on the head of the bed. And then the endoscopist, and the, the endoscopist, who is number one here in the in the in this little sketch, uh, it's going to be in front of, of the patient. Uh, the patient usually it's a little bit with the head up, and we're going to use a black block. The tower and the auxiliary video um, tower are behind the endoscopist, and we have a monitor in front of them um, so that you you know you can look at that one when you're doing the procedure. So to start, we're gonna start with the oral intubation with the scope. And uh, as I said, you wanna use a bi block to, to um, protect the teeth. And some people use uh, a lidocaine spray to numb the back of the throat. Um, so we start by uh, introducing the scope through the mouth. You wanna make sure that the, that the tongue is on the roof of the monitor. And you're gonna follow the curve of the tongue with uh, using the beat wheel mostly. So here in figure A, you can see that, then you get to the back of the tongue, you're gonna to see the epiglottis and you're gonna stay behind it here in figure B. And then uh, you identify the um, or pharynx. Uh, usually you're able um, to see even the vocal cords and you're just gonna go behind them through the piriform sinus. I would say this is probably the hardest part of the procedure to get into intubate the esophagus. And you have to, um, maneuver a little bit uh, using insufflation and uh, slight pressure to get through the upper esophageal sphincter and get in through the esophagus. Then once you're in the esophagus, you wanna make sure that you're examining the esophagus while you come down through it using a, a little bit of insufflation. Um, you're gonna get down to the G junction and what you're gonna make sure that you're examining that, that you're measuring um, how far it is from the teeth uh, and usually you're, the landmark you're going to find is, is the, the folds, the gastric fold uh, it will be the top and that's when it transitions from the esophagus to the stomach and that's your G junction. Hey Jessica, and, uh -huh. I think your slides are stuck again. Um, oh. Maybe try outside of presentation mode okay. or whatever you just did fixed it. But um, I think as you're advancing your slides, they kind of get frozen and oh, okay. um, either pixelated. Can you see that now? You can see that, yeah. So I don't know what you did, but now we can see what you're talking about. Okay, sorry about that. Well, so we're in uh, figure E where um, you want to identify the G junction and the Z line. So the Z line will be the transition of your squamous mucosa of the esophagus into the columnar epithelium uh, on the stomach. You want to make sure you know that you can see how the C line looks, if it's regular, and all those things that you're going to notice. Um, so next, once you get to the stomach, you're going to slowly insufflate. I I moved I moved on. I don't, let me know if the slides are not progressing. Yeah, um, not progressing. Maybe just a back and forth again. Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, so once you're in the stomach, you're going to slowly insufflate uh, and you're going to suction all the remaining fluids that there is. You want to prevent any, um, you know, uh, reflux of that, flu of that fluid. Um, you're going to examine all the walls, the greater curvature, the lesser curvature, especially the angularities. Uh, sometimes some, some of the most common pathologies can be found there. And you want to retroflex. To do that, you're going to put the tip of the scope closer to the angularities, and then you're going to pull the, the uh, large wheel all the way back towards you and um, using your right hand to um, kind of wiggle and rotating it, your right hand, you're going to be able to look at the G-junction from, from the bottom and um, look, have a better look of the fundus of the stomach. So this maneuver is really important because it also helps us identify hiatal hernias or any other lesion or, or pathology that might be going on in this upper part of the stomach. Then we're gonna proceed to uh, transverse the pylorus. So um, 
to do that, you don't want to have a very dilated stomach because then your scope might loop in the greater curvature. So just as I said, when you're looking at the stomach, just not try to be careful and not overinflating. Uh, you're going to identify the pyloras and then keeping it in the middle, you're going to push in and sometimes you have to wait until the peristalsis of the stomach goes because sometimes it'll like block your vision and yet once you are in front of it you know small pressures like it'll help you push in until it kind of pops into the duodenum um once you get into the duodenum here figure c uh you're going to examine the duodenal bulb uh, especially it's important because um it's, it's a common area for ulcers or bleeding uh, so you want to make sure that you really look at everything in the duodenum and then to intubate the second portion is also maybe the, the second more uh, hardest part of the endoscopy. It's doing this, this maneuver. Um, you're gonna go in through that little loop and then you're gonna pull back the large, the large wheel on your scope and the little wheel you're gonna put all the way forward while turning your body on the endoscope to the right side and slightly down kind of like if you're dancing with the scope, like one of one of my mentors used to say, and that way, your the tip of your scope will will get into that lumen, and you'll be able to see the circular um, faults of the duodenum. Uh, usually, there's a lot more bile there, and you'll be able to look at the papilla. So that's the complete endos the upper endoscopy at this point. Now you are going to take any biopsies if you need to, or a therapeutic intervention that you're. Uh, need to do. And then when you're withdrawing the scope, you're going to make sure that you're um, suctioning the air out to, um, you know, alleviate some symptoms a patient may get post-procedure. Post also important is to take pictures while you're doing the procedure. And if you do have to take some biopsies, usually you can just use the biopsy forceps, make sure that there's no bleeding afterwards. Uh, if there's something that you need to biopsy, to, that if it's something bigger, you might need a snare. Um, usually the, the biopsy forceps, it's, it's good. So some of the most common findings are of gastritis or um, gastric ulcers. So in gastritis, um, can you see my next slide? Um, no, you might need to do a forward back again. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. all right. So, um, gastritis, you see some erythema in the mucosa, some erosions. Usually you kind of lose some of those uh, gastric uh, folds and you, you can see the, the vessels underneath. So when you see that, you want to make sure that you take appropriate biopsies. So you're going to want to take one or two and um, in five different spots, uh, two in the, in the antrum along the greater and the lesser curvature, two in the cardio of the stomach along, again, the greater and lesser curvature, and one by the um, instura. And um, you also might wanna take some duodenal biopsies to rule out Crohn's or celiac disease. Um, and of course, you're gonna send this, this specimens for H. pylori, which might be also uh, contributing to the gastritis. Um, if they're ulcers, uh, the biopsies are, are, it's different because it'll depend on how the, the ulcer looks. Um, they might be in the stomach or in the duodenum ulcers. And uh, if it looks like a benign ulcer, kind of like the picture in the middle where they're, um, you know, they're smooth, regular, have like rounded edges with more flat and, uh, and, a, and a base that it's filled with exudate that looks more like a benign ulcer and doesn't really need a biopsy. But if it looks like the one on your on the right side of the screen that looks more uh, you know malignant with a big uh, protrusion in the middle, uh, irregular. Um, you might you you want to take some biopsies, and the, the the way to do that is that you're going to take four quadrant biopsies from the edges of the, of the ulcer. Um, usually, you can see also the 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 folds are more prominent around the ulcer and, and the ones that look more malignant. Um, moving on for Barrett's esophagus. So who, who do you wanna screen for Barrett's? So usually patients who have hiatal hernias, who are older than 50, who are male, white, uh, who have chronic uh, GERD and um, smokers, 
those are more prone to have Barrett's and you, you wanna make sure that you're screening those patients. Also patients who already have a history of Barrett's, you wanna keep screening them. And, and we'll talk about uh, how often that needs to happen in, in a second here. Um, so the gold standard for Barrett's, obviously it's a biopsy, endoscopy and biopsy. Usually you find like a salmon um, color a tongue coming up in the esophagus and in this irregular uh, form. Um, so to do the biopsies for that, usually you wanna do a four quadrant every two centimeters, one to two centimeters above the G junction. And endoscopists are um, more successful in diagnosing um, Barrett's when it's a long segment versus if it was a, a short segment. Uh, there's the prac, prac, uh, prac criteria where you can you can measure um, how how much is the extent of the Barrett's um, in 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 the lower esophagus. But once you take the biopsies, you you know you want to make sure that you have a real diagnosis and. Um, the diagnostic criteria is that you have a columnar epithelium lining that is more than one centimeter off the distal esophagus, and then a histological findings that are characteristics are the metaplasia, intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells. So, um, what what do we do when we find these patients that seems on the endoscopy that have Barrett? So, um, Can you do another you, forward and backward, real quick. Yeah, sorry. So. If you um, took the biopsies, but they weren't adequate on the first EGD, then you need to repeat them, repeat the EGD with biopsies within the first year. Um, if the biopsy did not show any dysplasia, then you wanna repeat the biopsy in three to five years. If it, it, was, if it was indefinite for dysplasia, then you wanna optimize the anti-reflux medication treatment that you have the patient on, you wanna send those slides to a second to get a second opinion from a from a second pathologist and you want to repeat the EGD with biopsies in two to six months. If the patient does have this dysplasia in the, in the initial biopsies, then it's different. If, if, they, if they had low grade, high grade or intramucosal carcinoma, then we can try endoscopic uh, eradication with um, um, Oh my gosh, I'm looking out. But uh, if, if it's uh, if it is esophageal carcinoma, then then you, they need surgery. Um, so uh, moving on from Barrett's, and we talk about how when you retroflex, you can um, identify hiatal hernias. So we have the Hill classification. That's a great system to um, grade. The and or assess the the incidence of reflux uh, that the patient might have because what it does it it grades the gastroesophageal flap valve and so the higher the heel grade the higher the frequency of reflux and the and the increased prevalence of a hiatal hernia which correlates with having a weaker or a, a lower lower esophageal uh, sphincter pressure so on the grade one here you can see. Uh, on the picture is uh, you, once you retroflex, you're gonna have a very uh, prominent fold around your scope and it's very tight. And grade two, uh, you have a less prominent fold and uh, you can see how the lesser curve um, intermittently can open and close the tightness that it is around the scope. And grade three, uh, the, the, the fold is, it's almost not there, but it's still, um, but you can still see only uh, columnar epithelium. And in grade four, you, it's completely open. Most of grade four correlates with a uh, hiatal hernia and you can see the esophagus lining. When you use endoscopy for bariatric surgery, it is really important for bariatric surgery because you kind of use it at all the stages. So preoperatively, it's really important because some of these patients have already had any some sort of uh, foregut surgery. So they might have had some uh, previous bariatric surgery, like a band, and you wanna make sure that you examine that in case that it's eroded, or they might have um, any other type of uh, GI surgery. You also wanna evaluate for reflux because that might um, alter what type of surgery you're gonna offer the, the, the patient. And you wanna rule out H. pylori because it is very common in obese patients, about 30 to 40% of them will be positive and you wanna treat it, especially if you're 
you know, considering doing a, a bypass, then you won't have access to the distal stomach and the duodenum. Intraoperatively, it's very useful because we use that to, uh, you know, do a leak test. You want to um, you use it also to make sure that there's no bleeding, that the anastomosis is patent or this leaf looks, looks okay um, while you're in the operating room. And if something doesn't look right, then you can fix it right away. And postoperatively, it is very used for, for any uh, symptoms that this patient might present, like abdominal pain, nausea, dysphagia postoperatively. Um, you know, they can, you can diagnose a stenosis in the, in the anastomosis or a gastrogastric fistula or a marginal ulcer. Some of this stuff you can even treat or do some sort of therapeutic intervention at the same time, uh, like a balloon dilation for the gastrodigenostomy or clips in the gastrogastric fistula or stenting. And it is used for any other uh, foregut surgeries intraoperatively, like fundal applications. You can use it to assess how tight the, right, the wrap is, uh, or if you do uh, a, my a heller myotomy, it will help you also assess for leaks. And postoperatively, same as for, bi for, for bariatric surgery, if the patient has some sort of symptoms that you, you might need to scope them afterwards to assess this, again, if it's too tight, if they have some sort of stenosis, or if the, if the, if the parasophageal hernia recurred. So moving on to um, lower endoscopy. Uh, with this, obviously, we're going to assess everything in the colon from uh, the distal ilium all the way to the anus. Um, the same as for upper endoscopy, the indications vary depending. You can use it for diagnostic, screening, or therapeutic uh, indications. As we talked before, these patients need to be prepped, and there's multiple different ways to uh, or things that are, that are products that are used to prep the patients. But the importance of this is that uh, depending on the preparation of the colon, it's going to be a more successful procedure. So we use the, the Boston um, Bowel Preparation Scale Score to assess how good the patient is prepped. Um, if that zero will be the first one in the left over side of the screen and, and three will be the one in the right, like the, the excellent prep. So the maximum, you will score it every uh, portion of the colon. So the, the right or ascending, transverse and descending or left side, and then you'll give a score uh, overall the, 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 the prep. So for diagnostic indications uh, for GI bleedings um, or, or patients who have um, uh, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, uh, lower GI symptoms, mostly like diarrhea. It is not commonly uh, used for patients who have chronic constipation unless they have associated symptoms like weight loss, um, abnormal imaging like uh, on a CAT scan or on a gastrographing or barium enema if they have a feeling defect or thickening of the, of the, of the wall uh, or a mass lesion that you can see in any of the imaging, then you want to um, follow up with an endoscopy. Uh, it's important in patients who already have a diagnosis of colon cancer, or rectal cancer, because especially colon cancer, because they can have a metachronous uh, lesion. So you want to complete the colonoscopy to make sure they don't have a lesion somewhere else. Uh, it is also used intraoperatively to localize the lesion sometimes. If you can find it, if, even if it was tattooed before, or um, to assess the anastomosis. Uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, it's used to uh, make a diagnosis or to assess the extent of the disease uh, and evaluation of the terminal ileum also for Crohn's or inflammatory bowel disease or, or bleeding. For screening, I would say it's the most common um, reason to do a colonoscopy, screening for colon polyps or in colon cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. So um, the, the screening for colon cancer starts at, at age uh, 50, although it's changing to 45, especially in high-risk patients, um, and usually goes until age 75, although it kind of, de it, 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 it depends on, uh, on, on the patient history as well. So if the colonoscopy is normal, uh, you want to recommend repeating it every 10 years. But if you do find a polyp, it will depend on the type of polyp and the size. Uh, 
and then you repeat uh, the colonoscopy, the recommendation will be to repeat the colonoscopy at, one, at six months, one year, three years, or, or seven to 10 years. Um, and therapeutic indications uh, for a dilation of a stricture, for colonic decompression, for, for example, a sigmoid volvulus, uh, for foreign body removal, uh, palliative stenting, or, or taking care of a bleeding from a malignancy, and for percutaneous endoscopic cecostomy tube placement. So the position in the endoscopy suite, it's uh, a little bit different because the, the patient is also in the left lateral the, the position. Um, obviously, the endoscopist is in the other side of the bed, um, but the rest of the setting, it's, it's kind of similar as, as what we talked about before. So to start the procedure, um, this scope is obviously longer and um, you, might need to maneuver more with the um, large and little wheels on the scope, especially once you're farther up in the, in the most proximal uh, colon. So to, to begin, you always want to start by uh, externally inspecting the anus and the perianal area. You want to make sure there's no lesions there. You want to do a digital rectal exam, uh, make sure that there's nothing in the anal canal. And also because that helps uh, kind of dilate a little bit the sphincter to pass the scope. And once you pass the scope, you're gonna start with a, a small insufflation and you wanna see the, re the three rectal valves here in the upper picture um, slowly coming up. And then you, uh, uh, you, know, you reach to the sigmoid and the sigmoid is probably the hardest part uh, to transverse sometimes because it can be very tortuous. And sometimes depending on the patient, it might be less mobile than others. And also uh, the, the problem with transversing this part is that the scope can get looped here and it, it's a little harder to get to the other uh, areas of the colon. So um, here you have to be extremely care careful of not over in, in inserting the scope or not over inflating either or insufflating. And, and you wanna keep the, the sigma collapse and chores so that you can pass through. Also important to keep uh, the lumen in the center and, and make sure that you properly identify the lumen because some patients might have some diverticulum that you obviously don't want to go through those. Um, once you get to, to you pass the sigma, you get to the descending colon and it usually looks like a tunnel view. Um, you're going to go up all the way to the uh, splenic flexure and it transverse that and get to the transverse colon that looks like triangular folds. Uh, and the flexures, both splenic and hepatic flexures, is sometimes you can get paradoxical movements, meaning when you're pushing in the scope, it looks like you're actually retrieving it. Um, that can happen if uh, your scope got looped. So you have to maneuver through this loop sometimes the maneuver is pulling back until you stop those paradoxical uh, uh, movements and then continue to push forward or pushing back forward and jiggling and using your suction to maneuver. Sometimes you just have to change the patient's uh, position into like supine uh, or put pressure in the left little quadrant where the sigma is so that uh, the scope can advance. And you can also play with stiffening the scope um, if, if that's something that you, you feel like it's gonna help you advance the scope. Once you get to a splint, it's, uh, the hepatic flexure, it's a more sharp angulation here in the left uh, corner. You can see uh, a picture. It's, it's uh, sometimes confused uh, with the cecum, especially if the folds are not distended and it can look like the confluence of the tenia. Uh, usually once you pass that flexure, um, the scope either falls already into the cecum, especially in people that has uh, a short ascending colon. So you reach the cecum, you wanna identify the landmarks, the confluence of the tenia, the appendiceal orifice, and the lysical valve. Um, if you can, you wanna uh, intubate the, the, the ileocecal valve and get into the terminal ileum to, especially if you're looking for Crohn's or you need to take biopsies for, or, or you're assessing for bleeding. The most important part I think of colonoscopies is the withdrawal. So you have to be very careful. It take, a, take at least six minutes in withdrawing your scope and um, inspecting all the mucosa. So that here's where the prep is really important because you, you don't wanna miss any lesions. Uh, while you're pulling back, you wanna make sure that you're suctioning some of the air 
so that the patient doesn't uh, stay very bloated afterwards. And at the end, when you get to the rectum, you want to retroflex to make sure that you can identify any hemorrhoids or any lesions in uh, the, the anal canal or the, the end of the rectum. Um, some tips, I think we talked about most of them, this already, so I'm going to move on. Um, some of the, the most common situations you'll find, obviously polyps. So you can do a polypectomy uh, with a snare, especially if they're smaller, less than uh, two centimeters. Sometimes if they're very, uh, if they're not uh, pedunculated, you might need to um, put, put a little bit of saline in this submucosal space so that it raises up the lesion and you can take the biopsy. Um, if, the, if the mass is large, then you might need to take it out in a piecemeal fashion meaning different pieces of it. If the mass looks malignant uh, or it's very big or large, you wanna take different biopsies. So make sure that you have enough tissue to make a diagnosis and you wanna make sure that you tattoo the area. At least you wanna tattoo it proximal to the lesion and, uh, or try to do it proximal to the lesion. You wanna do at least in three different spots because if you only do it on one spot and you're in the mesenteric side of the colon, once you go in surgically, you might not be able to identify the location. So intraoperatively and postoperative uh, usage of colonoscopy, as we said before, sometimes you can use them to identify the lesion. If the tattoo, for some reason, you can find it um, to assess for leaks after a colorectal anastomosis or a colonic anastomosis of bleeding. And postoperatively for same symptoms of bleeding, you wanna use it for surveillance. Uh, and uh, if you have a stenosis, you might, you might, you might use it for uh, and treat it at the same time with dilation. And that's it. Any uh, questions? I'll be happy to answer. That was a great talk, Jessica. Thank you. Um, one of the questions came from uh, Dr. Pai, who uh, referenced at the beginning of your talk when you're doing um, upper endoscopy was asking, what is the purpose of the administration of topical lidocaine um, in diagnostic upper endoscopy? And wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I'm trying to, okay. I am, um, some people use it, it's, it's not that commonly used. Some people like to use it to numb the back of the throat of a patient uh, so that when you pass the scope, it's a little bit easier, but um, it's definitely not used by everybody. And there's a little bit of a sidebar conversation going on um, about uh, sampling methods in upper endoscopy for um, Barrett's. Uh, Dr. Sheda asked if anybody else was using uh, technology such as Watts or Cellvisio. Um, I personally don't have a lot of experiences with this. We don't do a lot of Barrett surveillance where we are. Um, I don't know if you have any comment or if you're doing any Barrett's um, sampling or surveillance. Um, I'm not either, so I'm not really sure. I don't know if somebody else in the audience might have more more experience with it. Yeah, we can we can let the uh, the comment stream uh, address that. Well, thank you from so much for your time. That was a great talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, I'm going to take over the screen share here. Um, I did want to point to uh, one paper real quick to make a a plug, if I may. Um, let's see if this pops up. Uh, I know when I was a resident uh, in training, uh, when I was doing the um, upper endoscopy after fund applications, uh, by the time I got the scope in and did the uh, retroflex, um, my attending's like, okay, looks good, take out the scope. And I had like no time to understand really what I was looking at. Um, so I wanted for people um, who don't uh, either do a lot of um, foregut upper endoscopy after fund application, um, or just want a better sense of what they're looking for. This is a really nice paper uh, by Blair Job and uh, many, many colleagues that uh, look at um, what um, the GE valve needs to look like after various forms of fund application. So um, this is a nice paper that uh, uh, I wanted to plug that um, I've used that as a reference. So, all right. So next up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Edward Jones from the University of Colorado and the VA Medical Center who's going to be talking about enteral feeding access. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you. 
All right. Well, <clears throat> as you heard, I'm from uh, Denver and we put in a number of feeding tubes, as I'm sure um, you all do. I did a number of these when I was a fellow as well. And so I just want to kind of review how I do it and what I'm thinking when I'm trying to put in a G tube or a GJ or a percutaneous J. And what are the kind of indications, risks, benefits, and so on? I have no disclosures. So to start off with, we'll just start talking about what are the indications for a peg tube. And there are a number of them out there that can be broken down into three uh, major groups. The first, I think, is the uh, most common inability to take anything by mouth. That can be nutrition, it can be hydration, it can be medications. In fact, there's a specialized uh, GJ tube out there that uh, a company uh, utilizes, I think it's AbbVie, uh, for continuous infusion of a carbidopa um, version for Parkinson's medications. And it helps kind of smooth the uh, delivery and helps improve their symptoms. Uh, a more rare indication, but nonetheless something, uh, some reason we may be asked to put in a tube. It can also be used for decompression, especially in the case of malignant obstructions, patients who are going home on hospice maybe, who don't wanna have a tube hanging out of their nose, uh, we can place one for that. Indication for torsion, gastric volvulus, big parasophageal and a 90 plus year old who's not gonna tolerate an operation. We can uh, put a tube in, straighten out their stomach and uh, get them on their way. And then finally, uh, access for therapy. You can see some pictures there of a Roux and Y gastric bypass. And if you're to traverse the Roux limb to try and get back up to access the biliary tree, it can be very challenging. You may have to use a Peds colonoscope, uh, double balloon tube or a scope, and it can take a long time and only be done at specialized centers. However, if you're able to put a G tube into the remnant stomach, then they can use their normal equipment, access that and manage the biliary uh, disease that they need to uh, at that time. Before we proceed with any of these tubes, we need to be assessing these patients preoperatively. And we need to make sure that there's an appropriate indication. This isn't the situation like it is in a lot of GI labs where patients uh, kind of show up and you kind of look them up in the five minutes before you perform the procedure. These are commonly inpatient consultations or at least in clinic. And most commonly these are post-stroke, they have significant dysphagia, maybe ALS and so on. One thing I do want to mention specifically and caution about is patients who you're asked to place a tube for dementia. If the de dementia is so advanced that they're unable to take anything by mouth, then their mortality and their disease process is near its end. In fact, in one study, there's a 54% 30-day mortality. Patients who had advanced dementia, no other indications for the tube it was placed. And in fact, that uh, increases to uh, 90 plus percent if you look at six months. And so uh, patients who are demented, uh, those also who are combative may yank out the tube. The risks may outweigh the benefits. We need to pay attention to their anatomy. Have they had prior surgery? Do they have a gastric bypass or some other kind of alteration in their anatomy that's gonna make it challenging? We don't wanna get in there and start looking around and all of a sudden see there's a GJ anastomosis uh, and be trying to figure this out in real time. We also need to look out for their comorbidities. Do they have ascites? How thick is their abdominal wall? And we'll talk about contraindications in just a second. Uh, but these are things that we need to identify beforehand before we're inserting the scope and starting the procedure. Uh, in these patients, we may be considering preoperative imaging or something else to help us uh, plan, maybe perform it in the OR so we can use the laparoscope if we need to get it in there. Informed consent is of course key. And the one thing I do wanna mention, I'll mention it a couple times is the use of antibiotics. I do believe now this is considered the, uh, the gold standard is to give a single dose of antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection. Contraindications, absolute contraindications is you can't get the scope down into the stomach. And the other absolute I'd probably express is a life expectancy, life expectancy four to six weeks. If the patients aren't going to live greater than two months, there's not a whole uh, heck of a lot of point of putting in a tube uh, taking the risk of placing it if they're not really going to be able to use it. Relative contraindications, there's quite a list here. Ascites, tubes have been placed safely in there. Uh, coagulopathy, gastric varices, patients who are undergoing dialysis. I'm not saying you can be uh, willy-nilly about placing tubes in these patients, but a PEG has been safely placed in all of these patients in the appropriate situation. Sometimes you need some preoperative imaging and you need to be able to uh, see how big that liver lobe is to see if you can get around it or not prior to the surgery. 
And if you're worried about it, again, maybe you need to be planning a backup, either laparoscopic cysted or open. Moving on to how I do it, PIG technique, and hopefully this is just a, a brief review for most of us. We want our patient semi-recumbent, a little bit of head up that helps reduce the risk of aspiration, protects the airway to a certain extent. Not all of these patients need to be intubated a number of places, and, and I as well will place these just using conscious sedation, um, but it depends on the patient themselves. We want to provide some restraints. Sometimes that can be as simple as having the resident or your nurse uh, be available to hold their arms down should they try to reach up, or we can actually use uh, real restraints during the procedure. We don't want them reaching up and yanking things while we're doing our procedure. And then the uh, recommendation and guidelines now are to give antibiotics. Cefazolin is, is the most common one to two grams, depending on weight. And we want to be picking a site about two centimeters or so, a centimeter and a half below the rib cage. Sometimes this is going to be in the mid axillary line on the left. Sometimes it can be in the midline. Sometimes I've placed tubes that come out on the right side, but the key for me is really to avoid placing it right off that rib. Patients who have to have a tube in place for a long period of time, if you place it right on that rib, it is, it is very bothersome to them. In addition, once you've chosen that location, your two finger breasts below that rib space, you're gonna to wanna to really blow up that stomach, maximally insufflate it and look for that translumination. You can press down with your finger and if you see that nice glow, that is very reassuring that there shouldn't be any kind of organ in between you and the skin. You're gonna press down again and look for one-to-one -one motion. The stomach wall and the lining of the stomach, endoscopy goes down when you press on the abdominal wall at the same time. Tips and tricks, again, maximally insufflate. A lot of times they'll be working with a resident and they kind of take their finger off of the uh, insufflation just to give the patient a break from the carbon dioxide. And in this scenario, you really want to blow that stomach up. You want to drive it below that costal margin. You want to push the colon if it's free floating out of the way. Keep that head of the bed elevated. That also helps the stomach kind of uh, almost move down into the lower abdomen. And in particular patients, you want to be reviewing their preoperative imaging. In cases when you don't, situations like this could occur where everything went well, you had good one-to-one -one motion, you put in your finder needle, and the patient becomes unstable, you take them to the OR and find you've went through the left lobe of the liver. This is something we should best try to avoid. So the safe trap technique, as I already mentioned, we're gonna maximally insufflate, do our translumination one-to-one -one motion. And then what I call the Ponsky technique is to use your small needle, usually the needle you use to put in your lidocaine and aspirate as you're entering the skin. You shouldn't see any air in the needle until the endoscopist sees the tip of your needle. If you're pulling in air and no one sees the tip of your needle, you're probably in another luminal structure and that is not a safe location to go. <clears throat> you wanna take it slowly and use all of these three things to help ensure that there's no intervening organs. A couple other tips and tricks. On the skin incision, we really want it only to be the size of the tube itself. And you don't need to enter the lumen of the stomach. There's been a number of times where uh, I'll see an 11 blade and it'll plunge all the way in through the stomach uh, and you see it poking in uh, endoscopically. That is not necessary. You really only need to get through the skin and dermis. When you place that finder needle, we also need to be paying attention to the angle that it enters the stomach. We want it to try and be as perpendicular as possible. Sometimes on the skin, that means an angle aiming up to the patient's right shoulder. Whatever it may be, we need to keep in mind what that angle is so that we can mimic that same angle with a larger angiocath. And when we place it, we wanna use a smooth but forceful insertion. If we go too slow, it tends to tunnel along in the serosa or in the submucosa of the stomach. And instead you want it to go straight through in a perpendicular fashion. Securing the tube, you gotta have laxity. And we'll talk about buried bumper and I'll show you some photos in just a little bit. If you don't have laxity, you're going to cause a lot of problems. One centimeter, some papers will recommend two centimeters. The way I do it is during the procedure, I'll lift up on the tube and I'll look with gentle pressure where the skin lies. And if it's at four centimeters at the skin, I'm going to add one centimeter. So that's five centimeters. And that'll be where the lower edge of the bumper is. Most of these bumpers are a centimeter in size. So the upper edge of the bumper will be six centimeters. I will only report the six centimeter number in my operative reporter endoscopy. And that's because I don't want anyone to be confused. I want it to be very clear. And I like to report the upper number 
because that's what's easiest to evaluate when your residents, uh, fellows, and what have you evaluate the patient. They don't have to take any dressings down, pull up on the tube. They can just uh, pull up the gown and take a look and see, oh, upper edge of the bumper at six centimeters, we're good to go. We've also been starving these patients for a long time. When I was in training, it was 24 hours. Don't feed them before 24 hours. It turns out that we can give them full feeds within two to three hours. And so my current practice is they can get meds right away. And in two hours, they can start their feeds again. Delays of four, six, 24 hours or more, no change in complications, no change in the tolerance of feeds. And there's some references for you down at the bottom of the slide. So let's move on to complications. There are a number of minor and major complications that can be a result of this, uh, in theory, uh, simple procedure, infection, aspiration. And you can see a number of pictures there and let's just go ahead and start going through them. Aspiration can happen in up to 15% of patients. This is the highest risk for mortality of the procedure itself. If you look at patients who get a PEG, it's number two because the original reason, malignancy or what have you, that you put in the tube is more likely to kill them than the aspiration. But nonetheless, we need to be aware of it and prepared for it. An endotracheal tube is not a guarantee. One of my first deaths when I was a fellow was unfortunately a patient with scleroderma who was intubated, aspirated on intubation, PEG went fine, and unfortunately passed away because of that aspiration pneumonia. After the tube is in, there's no guarantee that they can't aspirate. There is known reflux that happens with feeds, especially with bolus, bolus feeds. And if patients are high risk, we need to consider feeding that small bowel, either adding a J-tube extension, which we'll ask, uh, talk about in just a little bit, or uh, doing a percutaneous or laparoscopic J-tube. And again, there's no guarantees against aspiration. This is something we always need to be aware of. We need to be feeding them with their head up, head of the bed elevated, as well as uh, in high-risk patients, preferentially doing continuous feeds as opposed to bolus. Infection is reported five to 65% of patients there are a number of different things that are reported as infections, and that's why I think our infection rate is reported as so high. You can see up on your right side, uh, there's a little bit of hypergranulation tissue. I don't truly think that's infection, but it was reported as one. However, there was a small abscess in the upper uh, middle section of your uh, screen. Usually these are staph aureus or beta hemolytic strep. A single dose of cefazolin is your best treatment up front. Uh, in a nice meta-analysis, you get a drop in 29% uh, post-op infection to seven. There is some new data, randomized controlled trial I've referenced down there, the Blumenstein trial of using a glycerin hydrogel pad, uh, reducing uh, post-op infections. I think the jury's still out on this. Uh, I'm not a big fan of using expensive dressings post-operatively. I think if we give them antibiotics and keep an eye on it, uh, most patients do just fine. Leakage happens in the majority of patients. It's gonna happen in most of the patients. And a lot of times it's due to excessive movement of the tube or a tangential exit from the skin. What do I mean by that? As you can see in the top of your screen here, I've drawn this nice kind of right angle, it says 90 degrees. The tube in theory should exit the skin at 90 degrees. If it does that, then the hole that it creates is a circle. But Patients don't like this because the tube pokes straight out. They can't wear their clothes. They can't wear a belt. And so what they tend to do is tuck it sideways. And when you tuck it sideways, as you can see in this bottom picture here, what tend to happen is that nice circle, if it were coming out perpendicular, turns into this ellipse, this bigger hole, and then they leak. And so what happens is they come in and someone who doesn't typically manage G-tubes will go ahead and tighten up the bumper. And that'll work for a little while until that bumper erodes through the skin or they'll put in a bigger tube and then the patient will go back to taping it sideways again and that'll work until the hole is bigger. What we really need to do is rediscuss with them how important it is to have the tube emerging at a 90 degree angle. We can also switch them to a low profile tube. Those are much easier without all of that tubing extending out beyond the edge. I have significantly less leakage in the patients that I've switched to low profile G-tubes. We also need to be thinking about their nutrition. They're not gonna be able to heal a tangential wound like the one on your bottom right uh, without having adequate nutrition. They're not gonna be able to heal a buried bumper syndrome without that. And also when you manage your hypergranulation tissue with silver nitrate or steroids or what have you, keep in mind that they're going to leak after that and you've gotta start give, making sure that their nutrition is adequate before you really manage that. So buried bumper syndrome, this is all about tension. When it was placed, someone cinched down that bumper and now that bumper is being pulled through the abdominal wall. 
hopefully it's discovered, as you can see in the middle picture, before it actually comes through. If it comes all the way through, unfortunately, you're probably headed to surgery to fix this. Maybe you can get by by upsizing it and a lot of patients, but the patient's going to leak like crazy. A lot of times it's associated with infection or abscess cavities. And the key to this is ensuring that one centimeter of laxity that I mentioned in the beginning and uh, making sure that that tube will rotate freely. If the tube has a lot of tension to rotate, then it's probably too tight. This can happen as early as three weeks out, but I've seen it months or weeks out after the procedure. Gastrocolic fistula, a uh, patient I manage in fellowship. I went in and uh, changed his tube out. He'd had it for about a year. The original peg, I switched him to a balloon tube, went perfectly. And I get a call, I go back up to see him. He says, ever since you changed it, I have diarrhea all the time. Looks like tube feeds. I'm like, great. So I run, I get some contrast. I'm thinking this is an emergency, I inject it. Sure enough, the tube is in the lumen of the colon. I call the OR, I get ready to take him back and, and do an X lap and I call my attending and he's like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just think about this. Is the patient sick? I was like, no. Was his belly soft? I'm like, yes. This is not an emergency. That's a well-established tract. And he was exactly right. There is a uh, low output fistula between the stomach and the colon. And there's a low output fistula between the colon and the skin. So all I had to do in that scenario was remove the tube, let it close up, and we performed a last lap assisted uh, G-tube about a week later. So the timing really matters in these patients as well as evaluation of them uh, on, uh, in the overall sense. Patients who have just had the procedure placed and it's in the colon, those patients may be headed towards surgery. If the tube's been in a long time and it just kind of slides a through and through lesion of the colon, maybe you can get away with just pulling the tube and then replacing it uh, as I did laparoscopically. Neoplastic seeding, this is very, very rare, um, less than 1% of the time. And these are tumor implants at the side of the peg. We think that uh, probably not when we pass the scope, but when we pull that G-tube all the way through past the tumor in the pharynx, down and out through the abdominal wall, that we drop some tumors, uh, little <clears throat> tumor cells at that site. And in patients, especially who have advanced squamous cell cancer, poorly differentiated, this can turn into a lesion there. Uh, however, a lot of times, um, and I've only managed a couple of these, you'll get the call and they'll be like, oh, you know, you brought tumor out onto the skin. In reality, this is more an effect or a result of tumor biology than it really is you dropping some uh, tumor cells in the skin. Uh, two thirds or more of these patients will have distant mets at the time of the discovery of this lesion and their overall prognosis is poor. Now, I think there is some real arguments that can be made for doing a push peg or even an IR guided peg to really avoid dragging that tube uh, alongside that tract. But I think there is, uh, the jury is still out. I think if the best option and most efficacious option is to do a peg in these patients, it is not chondroindicated and I think you can proceed. Although I would consider if, it, if the availability was there of asking uh, radiology to place the tube in, in these patients. Free air. Very, very frequent. The vast majority of patients, when they get their x-ray the next day, you just put in a bedside peg in the ICU. They say, call you and say, oh my gosh, there's free air. Very, very common. It lasts on average three weeks. It can last up to five to six weeks. The key is just to evaluate the patient. If they're not tender, their white count's the same or normal, you just keep an eye on them. This is just a result of uh, placement uh, in air during the procedure itself. Now, if the patient is really, really tender, but otherwise hemodynamically stable, a nice study by Bloom et al. Now this is very low numbers, retrospective study, but in about six patients, uh, they got obtained imaging prior to taking them back. And in those patients, they were able to identify uh, essentially 100% uh, <laughs> of patients who required uh, an exploratory laparotomy. Just relying on the exam alone, unfortunately, resulted in a 50% negative laparotomy rate. Patients with a fresh peg are going to have pain at that site. And so I think it's important, assuming again, that they're hemodynamically stable, they're not sick, <clears throat> then we should obtain a little bit of imaging to help us plan what we're going to do in the operating room. Tube blockage, very, very common. Highest in small, less than 16 French tubes, commonly a result of poorly crushed meds. I hear this all the time. Uh, I, I just didn't crush it very well and I, I put it in through the J-tube and now nothing's going through. Uh, 
Blended food as well as uh, high fiber and high caloric food can also block the tube. We really need to be making sure that they're flushing the tube every four hours when they're getting continuous feeds and if they're getting bolus feeds uh, at minimum before and after the bolus. If it is plugged and it's not an appropriate time to just change the tube out, then you can attempt flushing it, put 40, 50 cc's in a big Tumi syringe and kind of work it back and forth, see if you can flush it. You can use pancreatic enzymes and cope. I have also used a, a dream wire from the RCP kit to try and uh, open things up in patients who are too early to change out. The easiest thing in my opinion is to change the tube, but if it's not appropriate, then I think uh, attempting to open it up like this uh, can be done. The dreaded my tube fell out. They wake up in the middle of the night and the tube's laying on the bed next to them. I'm not sure what happens, um, but it's out. The classic teaching is this was in within four weeks of when you placed it, there's no tract. And so the stomach just fell away and now it's an emergency. The reality is, again, we gotta go back to examining the patient, seeing how they're doing. I have replaced the tube uh, as soon as 10 days uh, after it was placed initially. Uh, it went very smoothly. I got a uh, contrast study and it was in the right spot. That being said, <clears throat> I think patients in that period of time, we do need to keep a close eye on. And if they do show signs of peritonitis, then they need to be taken back, the hole closed and a new tube placed. Greater than four weeks out, typically we can try to replace the tube. The tube site closes very quickly, however. And so if the tube fell out right when the patient went to sleep and they wake up 12 hours later, then the likelihood of them getting another tube in is <clears throat> um, very, very low. What I do with my patients now is I'll send them home with a tube so that if they notice it in the middle of the night, they can get up, they can use the new tube and try and place it in. If it goes in nice, nice and smoothly, they can flush it, no pain, tape it in place, and now it's not an emergency. They can call me in clinic and we can change it out at their convenience. However, if they can't get it in, then unfortunately they're stuck going to the emergency department and uh, likely getting a replacement uh, endoscopically or surgically. Long-term management, a, a huge part of my uh, practice is to follow these patients over the long-term. I'll have them come in and do prophylactic tube changes. I replace the initial PEG tubes uh, eight to 12 months uh, after it was initially placed. Typically I'll tell patients eight months, you should come back and I'll switch you out to a balloon tube and they'll show up at 12 months. Uh, that's why I have the range there. For balloon tubes where you're instilling it with uh, uh, sterile water, Usually I'll be switching these out in the beginning at three months, but typically patients who are familiar with their tubes, you can switch it out every six months and it's no big deal. The nice thing about having them come to my clinic is I'm able to uh, evaluate the tube site. I'm able to manage leakage, hypergranulation tissue. I can again, tell them what to do if the tube falls out. And I found that this significantly reduces my emergency department visits. Uh, not only switching the tube out before all of the uh, water is kind of leached out of the balloon or the plastic itself breaks, um, but also <clears throat> uh, there's just a lot of comfort that the patients have by knowing that someone is, is working with them and keeping an eye on them. So I'd highly recommend uh, this uh, G-tube clinic or some form of management with a consistent uh, person. A couple more slides here, GJ tubes. Uh, these are commonly placed in patients. You're, you're worried that they're going to aspirate or if they have some gastroparesis. And so you want to feed distal to pylorus into the jejunum. You can place it primarily. You can do it during using either a push or a pull technique. Uh, if the patient already has a G-tube, uh, commonly you can do a through the G-J port. The downside of these is that the lumen of the J-tube is pretty limited, 9 to 12 French inside classically. And as I mentioned before, um, the smaller tube sides get clogged very quickly. Unfortunately, these GJ tubes have a massive reintervention re rate at six months, 50, up to 75%, 70 plus percent complication rate. Most common by far is these tubes are migrating. A patient that I managed when I was a, a resident uh, had a lot of vomiting. We switched her to a GJ. We thought that would solve things. And sure enough, two days later, uh, we see this little tube in the kind of back corner of her mouth and she had managed to retch enough that the uh, distal limb had come up the esophagus and was in the back of her mouth. And I think this is a relatively common finding is that J-tube just doesn't stay where it's supposed to be. The other downside of a GJ tube is that you can't just change it at the bedside. 
unfortunately, you're going to need to do, use endoscopy or fluoro to change it. And so it's somewhat a high maintenance tube. Uh, it can be beneficial in a certain number of patients, but in a lot, it can be just high maintenance. And finally, percutaneous J. genostomy tubes. Uh, this is uh, first described in 87, a Ponsky adaptation for patients with aspiration, gastroparesis, gastric outlet obstruction. It can be done with a standard EGD scope and a lot of patients, especially who have uh, altered anatomy, ruin Y gastric bypass, esophagectomy and whatnot. And patients who have normal anatomy, I'll typically try and use a pediatric colonoscope. You need that extra length to get around uh, the duodenum and into the jejunum. Uh, people who are experienced will have good success, up to 85% plus success rates. One of the tips that I uh, stole from an article out of the Cleveland Clinic was this idea of using your finder needle when it comes into the lumen and you found where you want to be after you've done your one-to-one -one motion and transillumination to just snare that. That kind of anchors that loop of jejunum in place and then just drive your larger needle right alongside it. Uh, then you can release, grab the larger needle and then proceed as you had in the past. You can use fluoro to place these or to identify loops if you're having a hard time transillumination. Transilluminating, typically I'll just kind of flail around for a while with the scope uh, and I can identify a loop that'll work. Uh, unfortunately, there's about a 2% uh, incidence of volvulus, and that's because you're not creating a tunnel. You have a single point of fixation with this J2. Uh, fortunately, it's rare, but when it happens, we have to take them to the OR and fix it. Uh, one of the major benefits, especially when you're comparing it to a GJ tube, is that it's very easy to replace. We can replace these at the bedside after it's been healed in for about four weeks. Well, I think that's all I have. That was kind of rapid fire tubes of all natures. Any questions or thoughts? Thank you, Dr. Jones. That was a fantastic review. Um, we did have a couple questions from the audience. Um, Dr. Yuza was uh, inquiring for uh, patients who have malignant obstruction where sometimes a peg tube will be placed uh, for venting uh, or decompression. Have you ever heard of, or uh, have you ever used an Aspire tube instead of a classic peg tube uh, for venting in, in those scenarios. The Aspire tube, I think, is that larger lumen um, weight loss tube, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I have not used that. Typically, uh, when I'm placing tubes, uh, I will place a 20 French in all patients, and in malignant obstruction, I'm placing a 24 French. Uh, I haven't placed any of the Aspire tubes. I'm not necessarily against it, but um, I do like to use the larger lumen uh, when it's done for obstruction. Excellent. Um, you had talked uh, previously about patients with advanced squamous cell carcinoma being potentially an indication for changing your PEG technique from um, the classic uh, pull to either the introducer or push technique. I was curious if you had any other indications to switching your uh, PEG technique other than malignancy. You know, that's a good question. Um, I think it's really uh, patient dependent. Uh, for example, we had a patient with a, a chronic recurrent small bowel obstruction. He had an NG tube in place, and uh, it would be relatively easy for our IR colleagues just to put some air in that NG tube and put in a, uh, a G tube for me instead of me having to use sedation and put a scope down his mouth. I think uh, each of these patients need to be addressed individually, uh, and you can decide what is the best tube to use uh, based upon the situation. I think the only time that I am consistently, strongly considering going to IR is in the patients that you mentioned and I described, that's the advanced pharyngeal squamous cell cancer uh, that's poorly differentiated, has high risk for metastasis. I think in those patients, it's, it's probably smarter to proceed down IR. Other head and neck cancers, I'll typically just proceed with the standard PEG. Excellent. Um, it's an interesting case you described for your uh, patient who had a, a GJ or J extension through the G tube, was able to cough it from the jejunum to the mouth. Um, I was curious when you're putting in jejunal extensions, do you uh, fixate or clip the distal end to the mucosa? Yeah, that's a great point. I almost always do. Uh, in that case, I was a resident kind of assisting and, and uh, the patient didn't. But now <laughs> with that in mind, I, I will clip the and you got to keep in mind too, so before you shove that jejunal limb in, if there's no suture or anything at the end of it, a lot of times I'll just put a, a stitch through the tip of that tube. That way it'll make it easy for me to put that clip in. But um, the short answer is yes, I am clipping those jejunal limbs in on the GJs. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that review. It was a fantastic talk. So thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you. All right. Well, next up, we're going to have a talk on endoscopic management of GI bleeding.
Um, Dr. Ujiki is on the front lines of uh, COVID. So um, his fellow, uh, Michael McCormick, is going to step in and um, uh, give us the talk on endoscopic management of GI bleeding. So we'll switch over the screen share now. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen real quick. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate it um, for having us, uh, for this opportunity to present. Are you guys seeing my slides okay? I know there were some problems with the slides earlier. Look okay on my end, thank you. Good. All right, so I'm uh, Dr. McCormick. I'm Dr. Jiki's fellow. We're over in Edmiston, Illinois at the North Shore. We're gonna present today on endoscopic management of GI bleeding. Um, and we have no disclosures. Uh, so traditionally, GI bleeding uh, can be categorized either to upper and lower GI, and they can be further subcategorized into either variceal or non-variceal. And I'll be upfront and honest with you right now that you know at our fellowship and our practice, we mostly deal with almost exclu exclusively upper GI bleeding. Uh, but we will talk about lower GI bleeding as well. Um, we use the ligament trites as a cutoff anatomically to divide them into upper and lower GI bleeds. Um, and then the lower GI bleeds can be further subcategorized into either small bowel or uh, large bowel. So uh, the purpose of this slide really is to kind of uh, show you that um, what's important here, what's the takeaway from this slide, isn't what's on the slide itself. It's rather that, you know, when you get a patient that has a suspected GI bleed, um, it's important to take a thorough history and physical because the etiologies can, you know, they can vary widely. Uh, so, you know, you include everything from infections, inflammations, iatrogenic, idiopathic, malignancies. There's a whole array of, of etiologies. So when you get a patient like this in your ER or your clinic or wherever you're seeing the patient in, in patient consultation, you have to both think about, you know, um, both the anatomy of where this lesion or this uh, hemorrhaging can be occurring from, but also the etiology behind it. And that's really gonna be obtained from a very thorough uh, history. So I, I can't stress that enough. When you see these patients, that's really where this starts. Uh, and obviously the clinical presentation is gonna vary as well. You know, this is, this is gonna come from either, you know, like this patient that you're seeing in your clinic that um, had a routine physical and was found to have iron deficiency iron deficiency anemia to um, the patient who's almost crashing in the ICU or the ER and hemorrhagic shock from, you know, just pouring out blood from their lower GI tract. So, um, you know, everything, the presentation is going to matter too. So it's going to vary um, pretty widely there. So uh, luckily for us, um, GI bleeds is a very algorithmic uh, problem, let's say. Um, Pictured here is two different algorithms. On the left side of the screen, you have upper GI bleeds. On the, on the right hand of the screen, you have lower GI bleeds. Um, and we can actually go through it a little bit. Um, so when they come in, um, you know, I think um, on the left hand side, they, they kind of talk more about the sort of critical patients. So you want to resuscitate those patients first. Uh, and we'll talk about this later on in the different guidelines, you know, but a PPI drip, uh, a scope, they, uh, the 20% the high risk, the 80% low risk, what they're referring to here in this slide and this algorithm is <clears throat> that um, most patients who have an, an, a peptic ulcer disease, because this is really a, an upper GI problem on this algorithm, um, the majority of the patients will do fine with just conservative management. Um, the 20% of patients who are high risk though are gonna continue to bleed uh, and they're gonna fail conservative management or they're gonna re-bleed later on. And if you look at the mortality and the morbidity and the outcomes on, these, on this problem, uh, the majority of, of the mortalities and morbidities lay in those 20%. So that's why that's important to kind of try to identify who those patients are and get treatment to them early. And again, we'll go through this uh, in a little bit on the guidelines and stuff. But you can kind of briefly see that there. Uh, lower GI bleed, uh, it varies a little bit. Uh, you can see occult bleed, like we just talked about in the patient in clinic coming with either some chronic fatigue or just anemia discovered incidentally on their um, physical. 
towards uh, severe hematochesia. Uh, and um, interestingly enough though, is even if they have sort of a lower GI bleed, um, you would kind of, you, you know, in melanin, you would go to EGD first um, before going to a colonoscopy. So uh, I think that's kind of interesting to point out. This nasogastric lavage, um, you know, there's some, there's some evidence to show that it's beneficial, uh, but it's really just to get a quick um, rule out of an upper GI source if the patient's coming in with a GI bleed. Uh, you do a nasal gas lavage and you can kind of quickly uh, see if they have a lot of blood in their stomach or not. So at least you know the esophagus and the stomach is fine uh, if you need to do anything emergently. Um, but we'll get into that here in a second. And this is a treatment algorithm on small bowel um, hemorrhage. I won't spend that much time talking about it. I just wanted to include it so you guys can see that it's there. Um, the treatment here really is going to be radiographic, both in terms of diagnosis and treatment. So angiography or embolization is going to be the overwhelming majority. There are some rare instances that you do use a push enteroscopy or a device-assisted enteroscopy, but um, you know it's really just for surgical altered anatomy and, and uh, things like that. So I won't spend too much time, or I won't really focus on that at all in this talk. So these are the AC, ASG guidelines for um, variceal bleeding. So this is the first subcategory of the two of upper GI bleeds. So in variceal bleeding, you know, they, you know, overwhelmingly they want you to treat them with antibiotics for a week. Uh, so when they come in, you're gonna, and you suspect very highly that they have an upper GI bleed, you're gonna start antibiotics, or once you diagnose them with that, you're gonna start antibiotics for a week. Um, prophylactically. Then you're going to start a PPI drip, you're going to start a triotide. Uh, and the triotide actually they, they've shown that you should continue that for three to five days um, after you have gotten control of the hemorrhage endoscopically. Um, they want you to in this case do urgent endoscopic intervention within 12 hours. Um, for the other types of GI bleeds they say within 24 hours. Um, but for variceal, you know, if they're cirrhotic and stuff, they want you to do it within 12 hours. Uh, here they recommend endotracheal intubation uh, to prevent aspiration because, you know, cirrhotics are at high risk for that. Um, EVL stands for endoscopic variceal ligation, which is really just that you band the varices. That's what you're doing with endoscope. You have a little special attachments and I'll show that on a picture later. And um, you can get right up to the, uh, to the varix and you can band it endoscopically. Uh, and that's for acute variceal hemorrhage or with stigmata of recent hemorrhage. Um, endoscopic sterile therapy, you know, injection of this glue and all those different um, therapies, they want you to reserve that if you fail the, the banding. So you should prompt, go to banding first. If that fails, then you have other options. Um, now, if you do do the banding, um, you, they actually recommend that you repeat endoscopy and, and possibly repeat banding every one to eight week intervals until the varix has eradicated. So this is something that you might end up doing a couple of times before um, it's resolved. And then obviously if endoscopy fails, you know, balloon tamponade with a sing stack in Blakemore tube or something um, is suggested according to the guidelines until you can uh, have more definitive therapy. Um, if everything fails, they do recommend a TIPS. So those are the ASGE guidelines. For non-variceal uh, upper GI bleeding, um, you know, again, you know, looking at the algorithm, you know, resuscitate prior to endoscopy. So they come in, they're hypotensive or whatever, then you resuscitate them first. Uh, medical therapy, they recommend that uh, PPI and then a prokinetic. Um, this is to help um, if they have a lot of clot burden inside their gastrum that the prokinetic helps you push that out before you do the endoscopy. So sort of clear the field, so it's a pre endoscopy. Um, the endoscopy is, um, should be done early within 24 hours, especially if they have a history of malignancy or cirrhosis. Again, you saw on the previous slide that it recommended within 12 hours on cirrhosis, but here they said within 24 hours. Um, if they have hematemesis, hypovolemia, anemia down to, you know, five is less than eight grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. Um, 
Uh, they do recommend endoscopic therapy for peptic ulcers with high risk stigmata. So meaning, you know, signs of recent bleed or a visible vessel or a clot, uh, things like that. Uh, they, they recommend that you do proceed with therapy even if they're not actively bleeding. Um, management of peptic ulcer disease with a adherent clot is a little bit controversial. The ASG do recommend that you use uh, sclerosing agents or cautery or, or other mechanical therapies like uh, CLIPS. Now, I think the most important thing of this guidelines that I want to take away, or that I want you guys to take away, is that they uh, recommend against using epinephrine only. So they want you to use epinephrine in conjunction with either cautery, so energy, or clipping. Um, the reason for that, obviously, is uh, you know that just injecting this epinephrine, the, the chances they're going to rebleed is pretty high once the vessels um, stop with their basic constriction. Uh, they recommend against routine use for um, uh, second look endoscopy procedures after you've had adequate um, hemorrhagic control. Um, I would assume that this is just because you know they don't want you to go in there and aggravate things more if, if that's the case. And obviously, there's no benefit to it doing it as well. So if the patient is clinically doing well and you feel like you have good adequate control of it during your procedure, there's no need to go back for a second look. Um, obviously, repeat endoscopy um, for recurrent bleeding is indicated. And then if everything else fails, then surgery. Uh, these are the guidelines from ASGE for lower GI bleeding. Um, they do recommend colonoscopy for cold GI bleed. I think that's you know pretty straightforward. Um, you know, that's kind of part of the uh, physician's task force guidelines as well for just in general people should get colonoscopies. I think now over the age of 45. Um, EGD for um, if colonoscopy is negative in a cold GI bleed is indicated. Um, so it's a little bit reversed there from the melanoma picture, but you start with colonoscopy first and, and the colds, and then you go to EGD. Uh, you should have a small bowel evaluation if in the EGD and the colonoscope is negative. Um, this is again, looking back, if they still have persistent uh, signs of a cold hemorrhage. Um, colonoscopy for people um, who are an advanced age above 50, or and with intermittent hematochesia, history of weight loss, these are sort of alarming symptoms, right, for a possible malignancy. Um, they should all have colonoscope. Um, younger patients without alarm symptoms, but having intermittent hematochesia, you should start with a digital rectal exam and a flexible stigmatoscope. So that's a little bit different treatment algorithm in that group. Uh, patient with melanoma, again, I said, you know, you start with an EGD and then you follow up with a colonoscope. Um, Severe hematochesia, hemodynamic instability, you start with EGD to rule out high risk upper GI lesions, and then you follow that with a colonoscope if the EGD is negative. Um, colonoscope within 24 hours of admission um, should be performed after you have done adequate rapid bowel preparation in patients with severe hematochesia. Reason for that is it's you know, not only going to help you perform your colonoscope, but it might also aid you in uh, localizing the source of the lower GI bleed because you might see fresh tracks of hemorrhage uh, on your colonoscope. And we'll go into that a little bit, uh, what we use. Um, epinephrine and energy coagulation of, um, or a clip for diverticular bleeding. So again, this is the same similar guidelines for the upper GI bleeds that you should use epinephrine plus a second modality for diverticular bleeds. Um, you should perform a clip or a tattoo placement adjacent to the diverticulum as well when you're in there in case you need to go back in case they re-bleed or something. Um, and then argon plasma coagulation is the preferred method of um, hemostasis for um, a bleeding angioectasis. So. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what to do when a patient comes in here and they have this, let's say, a uh, severe hematochesia. Well, you're going to get access first. Um, you're going to resuscitate them appropriately. Uh, you're going to avoid overtransfusion of the variceal bleeding patient. Um, you're going to start an IV PPI. And you're going to use a prokinetic. And you're going to give bowel prep. So four to six liters of go lightly. And it's actually been shown to increase your sequel intubation rates um, if a lower GI bleed is suspected. So uh, generally earlier in this endoscopy, again, this is all repeats of, of the guidelines. This is what we practice. And then NG2 lavage does not affect outcomes, but may lead to earlier 
Hey, Michael, I think we lost your audio. Michael, can you hear me? Um, in terms of equipment that we use, um, we use a, a large caliber scope. So that has the largest um, working channel to help with our suction capacity um, so that we can, you know, maintain visualization of, of um, the GI bleed. We have two different types of clips that you can use. Um, this clip right here is a through the, sco through the scope uh, clip. Um, you know, you can use either one. There's many different types and brands. Um, we like the Boston Scientific one, um, the 360, because that gives us um, the ability to articulate it and rotate it as we want it um, at the level of the uh, endoscope. And it also has one of the widest jaws, um, but there's many different ones. Um, they are nice, I would say, for smaller uh, diameter uh, cross section that you want to try to cover with the clip or if you can see the vessel and you can clip it directly. Um, the other option which is seen down here is over the scope clips. Uh, these I would say there's three different types and they, they vary based on their jaws. Some are blunted and more some are more piercing type uh, and they also vary in their uh, size and the, and the width. These are more used for sort of larger defects or areas that you want to try to cover. And I, you know, they have a wide um, both base as well as a, as a wider bite, if you will. And these are actually more permanent. So these would probably, these would fall off after a few weeks. These would be more permanent. And actually, if you want to remove them, sometimes you'd have to go in and cut these uh, arms here in order to remove them like physically cut them. So um, anyway, so injecting needle, obviously with epinephrine one to 10,000, these come usually preformed from pharmacy. Uh, if not, you can actually generate your own and inject, you know, up to one milliliter, milliliter at a time. Energy, we use, um, you know, argon plasma or uh, just direct contact coagulation with a heater probe. Um, it kind of depends on the lesion. Um, endoscopic suturing, here you see the Apollo overstitch. Uh, this is what we use. Um, actually, it's very effective. Um, I would much prefer that if I fail a through the scope clip to go to that rather than um, over the scope clip. I don't know if Dr. Jiki will comment on this later on, but um, anyway, um, poly loop. This is something for, you know, if there's a bleed and there's a stalk to the lesion or to the vessel, we can put a poly loop um, around the stalk and then, you know, try to do some other modality on top of the stalk. The stalk. Um, it's just a, a loop that, that kind of singes down. And then again, and the point here is to use your history. So again, do a, a thorough history and physical to try to think about what the lesion can be before you start picking what kind of equipment you would want and what's available to you. Uh, in terms of clot evacuation, again here, this probably should have been included on the previous slide, is a variceal bander. So this will go over the scope. So the scope goes in, um, the scope goes in here. And um, it's a whole thing where you see this line goes through the working channel of your scope. So that when your scope is in here, you see sort of on the rim of the picture, you see this rim of this clear plastic. And as you're pulling, if you have a special device that you attach to the scope, and as you, you rotate the, the device, it will actually pull, there's a level that will pull the string in. And as the string pulls in, the string goes, uh, you can't see it here, it's on the backside, but it actually deploys these rubber bands one at a time. So in this picture, it's been deployed. Here's a rubber band, here's a varus. Uh, so what you do is you go up to the varix with the endoscope with this tip here and you suction in the varix into your field so you can't see it anymore. And then you rotate the thing and deploys this band around it. Um, that's how they work. Uh, this is the snare, uh, this is the net. Um, this is a typical endoscopic net that we use. 
Uh, we can use that for cloud evacuation. It's actually pretty effective. It'll help us with visualization. Um, and then obviously the snare here uh, can help us as well sometimes if we want to see if there's any bleeding underneath the cloud. And that's all I have for endoscopic uh, bleeding. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. That's a fantastic talk. Uh, a couple questions um, that I came up with, uh, if you don't mind, I was wondering, uh, you talked about some of the advanced techniques uh, such as clipping and um, suturing. I was curious if you had any opinion about um, some of the newer devices such as hemospray as kind of a, either an adjunct or a last means uh, resort for controlling difficult uh, bleeding. Yeah, so I was thinking about including that or not in this talk and um, it's interesting that you bring that up. So uh, hemospray, for those of you that don't know that, it's a device that comes uh, kind of preformed, prepackaged, and um, you hook it up to your scope and you kind of spray a wide area of the intestine that's, that's bleeding with this mineral de derived agent that is supposed to kind of cake on to the lesion. And then when the blood it gets in contact with the blood, it not coagulates, but it forms like sort of a hard shell, if, if you will call it that almost. Um, we haven't used that uh, yet. We've had the rep in, we have almost used it once. Um, I would say that, you know, we don't have any experience with it. Um, so we haven't had the opportunity to use it. The way that the rep has kind of sold us on this is that it should be employed for lesions that are broad based. So if you have a, you know, some kind of inflammatory process of a large white area of the intestine, for example, and it's not brisk bleeding, so it's a wide area, low flow hemorrhaging, um, that's really the ideal situation for this device. That's my understanding of it. Um, have I put it into practice? Not yet. Um, so yeah, that yeah. I don't know if Dr. Jiki wants to chime in on that. Um, I'll see if he uh, decides to unmute and chime in. Um, one of the questions I had, you talked about um, adjuncts as well as kind of if you uh, have tried different techniques to control the bleeding or if you tried through the scope and none of it's worked, you kind of get to a point where you're thinking, okay, should I use an over the scope clip or uh, maybe endoscopic suturing? I was curious if you kind of have, a, have an algorithm in your mind in terms of um, kind of what would push you to use a uh, over the scope clip versus suturing in terms of tissue quality or the size of the bleed or a certain part of the GI tract uh, where you think one uh, technique may be more um, advantageous over the other. Well, so, you know, suturing, you're going to be in direct control. So the suturing is sort of a definitive therapy. Uh, depends on your comfort level of using the devices, to be honest with you. Um, there is a learning curve to, I would say, both. But I would say that probably suturing has more of a learning curve to it. Um, if you feel very comfortable with using the suturing device, then there is almost no scenario where you would not almost default to that over the, over the scope clip. Um, over the scope clip um, can be used for hemorrhage, but I think the main indication for it has really been to use it in, in sort of tract defects, you know, like fistulas or, or, you know, holes in the intestine where there's an abscess on the other side or something like that. Not an abscess, but, you know, any kind of defect um, that you want to close. Uh, I don't really have an algorithm, um, you know, if the tissue quality is poor, um, you would probably have a better result. You, you, regardless, you're gonna probably have a better result with the suturing. And the reason for that is that you have total control of where your bites are gonna end up being. Uh, over the scope clip, you have those jaws, they're gonna come down, they're gonna contract the tissues together wherever they go, and that's it. With the suturing, you can control where you place your sutures, how much tension you put on it, um, and so forth. Um, and, you know, interestingly, we've actually published on, you know, different patterns to use when you use the suturing device, because uh, there's a whole different types, different patterns that you can use when you suture. Um, we specifically looked at, um, you know, closing these, um, um, you know, tightening these GJ anastomosis after, 
weight regain from a RU and Y, and we found a, a specific pattern worked better in terms of controlling the, the size of the, the anastomosis. But um, obviously that's not applicable to this talk or this discussion. But um, my point with that is that the suturing gives you more freedom on what to choose, how to close the defect or how to control uh, a bleeding uh, vessel in this lesion in this um, scenario. Yeah, um, I would agree. Those uh, I've read some of Dr. Uh, Ujiki's papers in terms of uh, different uh, suturing uh, techniques. And as you said, I think you guys were studying more so as it relates to a bariatric endoscopy, but I would definitely highlight those papers for anybody who's trying to get a good understanding of um, um, mastering endoscopic suturing. So very good papers. Um, there was one other question that came up in the thread. Um, do you know, is there um, any limit to the amount of bands that can be placed um, in a single session for esophageal varices? I don't think anybody has ever described um, succumbing to bandemia. <laughs> I think that you have pretty much free reign on going on as many bands as you need uh, to control the, the hemorrhage. But um, uh, is there, is that like, I, I'm, I guess I'm not really understanding the question. Yeah, I think that the question just is uh, if there's a maximum amount of, of bands that you could do at one session for uh, patients with bleeding esophageal varices. I'm not aware of any data. Um, I think they may have been studied in the GI literature, but I, like you, I'm not personally aware of an exact number. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of so. control being the goal. My uh, personal experience is uh, not in an acute bleed, but when you're, you're bleeding them, and this is Eddie Jones, um, when you're managing these with red signs, uh, who may develop bleeding, I try not to do, you know, kind of a circumferential approach. If there's three big vessels and it's going to create this almost, uh, occlusion of the lumen, I'm hesitant to really go after it. I'll kind of go after the two big ones and then bring them back in three or four weeks and then get that third column and, and take a look again. Okay. It's similar approach, uh, when you're thinking about hemorrhoids in a sense, you know, I'm hesitant to do a three column hemorrhoidectomy because you don't want to stenose it down. I'd be curious to, to see what other people think. Yeah, we'll see if, um, if anybody responds to that in the thread. Um, I don't think we have any more questions relating to your talks. Uh, thank you, Dr. McCormick, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the talks from all of our speakers tonight. Uh, Dr. Jones, before you go too far, a couple more, uh, two questions popped up if you have a couple minutes. Um, I see a fair amount of discussion about T anchors um, or anchoring techniques for peg tubes. Um, I was curious if you had um, either an algorithm or particular patients that uh, you'll routinely T-anchor or fixate um, compared to those where you just put the peg in. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And <clears throat> I'm texting back and forth with uh, uh, Dr. Al Hayek and Dr. Paul I here. Um, you know, I, I hadn't thought about prophylactically doing it. Uh, Dr. Al Hayek brings up the point that in a patient who is demented, who may have a chance of yanking the tube out themselves, especially if they're combative, if you place some T anchors or T fasteners in there, um, and I don't have any pictures of those offhand, hopefully we know what we're talking about, uh, that can help keep that stomach wall opposed to the abdomen and, and allow you to replace it. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant in that situation if they're just going to keep yanking it out. You know, I, I come back to the idea is, is the risk uh, greater than the benefit in that situation, but I think that's a totally legit approach. Uh, I typically use them when I'm doing a push peg, I think is where they're classically described. Uh, you're holding that uh, wall up. Sometimes I'll actually do it when I'm doing a, um, a, uh, a laparoscopic cysted tube uh, and I'll help hold that up as opposed to trying to suture on the ceiling. I'm not doing any robotics yet uh, to kind of tack the uh, jejunum or the stomach to the abdominal wall. Instead, I'll drive a, a T fastener in or two uh, and then do a peg in that fashion. But that's typically when I'm using them. Uh, but I think, uh, like I said, a great point uh, in a patient you think is going to yank it out and is going to present in a day with the tube out, I think putting them in there, triangulating it around it, probably using three is not a bad approach. Yeah, great. I know at our institution, um, other patients uh, who would uh, likely get T anchors are uh, those who are getting any other type of endoscopic therapy. So if we're doing uh, jejunal extensions, um, or other uh, flexible endoscopic, uh, either tubes or other therapies. Uh, patients who are putting tubes in for, and they have ascites, uh, again, even though that may be a relative contraindication to doing the procedure, uh, 
Um, but if we do proceed um, doing anchors in that situation, and of course, any patients who may have poor wound healing, uh, whether they're on steroids, immunosuppressed, or uh, neutropenic patients as well. Um, I wanted to go back um, uh, to revisit one point again on tubes. Uh, the question was brought up uh, with the unclogging tubes, and uh, Dr. Jones mentioned that he uses um, a tumi syringe, uh, not all the way full, so he has some air in it as well, and kind of back and forth pushing and pulling to help unclog those tubes. Um, Dr. Pala had brought up uh, an alternative approach uh, that he taught me in practice as well is to consider using a small syringe, maybe even a TV syringe, um, and just using maybe five to 10 milliliters uh, of fluid in there. And since it's a smaller syringe, it should generate a, a higher pressure gradient or a pressure head uh, that potentially could help open up the tube. So I know plenty of us have been in the situation where you have a huge tumi syringe and you're just kind of yanking on that tube and pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling and all you want to do is get it unclogged so you're not replacing the tube. So uh, for those of you who ever get to that point and are struggling, uh, consideration of using a smaller syringe. Um, so that was a great talk. I'd like to thank everybody uh, on the board who uh, gave our talk today. And I appreciate everybody who turned out to uh, listen live. And uh, these should be archived on our group for future viewing. Um, I will uh, put up a screen share here uh, to show you kind of what our future directions are for our next three talks. Um, our round two of talks should be based on advanced flexible endoscopic techniques such as dilation, stenting, and management of gastrointestinal defects. Our third round will be on bariatric flexible endoscopy, including diagnostic um, endoscopy, uh, what anatomy you should be looking for in these bariatric patients, as well as primary weight loss procedures, revisional procedures, and management of bariatric complications with an endoscope. And our round four, uh, we'll be talking about submucosal techniques, uh, such as POEM, POP, and Z-POEM. And uh, we'll try to find a way to, and a time to fit in our talk on uh, use of endoscopic energy sources. So again, I would like to um, thank all our speakers tonight. And if anybody uh, uh, wants to give a talk or help us uh, in formulating future talks, uh, please reach out to us through the Facebook group. Uh, I hope you all are staying safe. Uh, continue to wash your hands and um, be well out there and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.